People who want to read the Bible kind of in a literalist and without any supernatural sense, they would argue it's really just a love poem that snuck its way into the canon, mm -hmm. and that's all that it really is. In the early church, it was the most interesting book of all of the books in Scripture. And really, for the first 1,800 years, it was one of the most commented on books in all the Bible. It's, it's a love letter, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a dialogue between a bridegroom and a bride that is, is very passionate, but it encapsulates the reality of our, our passion yeah. and our desire to be in love. This is the way that God loves us, his church, his people, and it's, it's really passionate. It, it's full, it's very beautiful, it's rich, it's alive. Welcome to the Bible Timeline Show. I'm Jeff Cavins. We are in for a treat today. We're in the Royal Kingdom, period, and that is the purple. That's the purple period on your Bible Timeline chart. Uh, the next one will be the black period, the divided kingdom. But the Royal Kingdom is really special because this is the point when Israel asks for a king. Now, that sounds like a good thing, but there's going to be some difficulties with it. The first king is going to be Saul for 40 years from the tribe of Benjamin. Then comes David, and that really is the, the quintessential king, and the kingdom uh, spreads large at that point. It, it's wide. And, and then we have, after David, we have Solomon, and those are the three kings. But in the midst of this United Kingdom period, this Royal Kingdom period. We have a number of books that are written. For example, we have Ecclesiastes, we have the Psalms, Proverbs, but there's one that you don't hear a lot of people talking about, and that is the Song of Solomon. Father John Burns is gonna be joining us today to talk about that. He's made it uh, really a, a focal point in, in his ministry to understand this and share it with us. And so, welcome to the Royal Kingdom. We'll be back with Father John Burns in just a moment. Good to have you. Great to be with you. Yeah, so, when I found out that you were like an expert on the Song of Solomon, <laughs> on the Song of Songs, at least you were impassioned there we go. Uh, over this book. Uh, we were thinking, man, we got to talk to him because who else are we going to get yeah. to talk about this? Most people want to avoid the book. Exactly. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, Father John Burns, a priest of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. I've been ordained for 13 years now and um, been in a bunch of different assignments, a couple parish assignments, back for doctoral studies and worked in vocations for a little while. And now I work full time for the Renewal of Women's Religious Life and a little ministry called Friends of the Bridegroom, oh, which wow. comes Dad's from I was going to say song. you. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. What do you hear? Uh, well, let's start with this. For the, for the sake of people who've never really read the Song of Solomon, also called S Song of Songs, uh, give us kind of a, a synopsis of this book that stands out as being literarily quite different from anything else we have in the Bible. Yeah, it's, it's probably, you could say, the most interesting book in the whole Bible, a including um, it's a kind of controversial book uh, mm -hmm. among even exegetes. You know, there's this question that everybody carries, like, why doesn't the Song of Songs mention the name of God at all? It, you could even argue there's not a lot of theology going on. And the, the naturalist school or people who want to read the Bible kind of in a literalist and without any supernatural sense, they would argue it's really just a love poem, a, a sexualized love poem that snuck its way into the canon. Mm -hmm. And that's all that it really is. <clears throat> Against that, there's this reality that in the early church, it was the most interesting book of all of the books in Scripture. And really, for the first 1,800 years, it was one of the most commented on books in all the Bible. Then, about 200 years ago, 150 years ago, Why do you became, think that is? Why was it so interesting? Yeah. It, it, it captures a number of things, and hopefully we can unpack them, but it's, it's a love letter. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a dialogue between a bridegroom and a bride that is, is very passionate, um, vivid at times, uses some language that sounds awfully sexual, which is why we kind of mm -hmm. panic or drop back from it. But, but it encapsulates the reality of our, our passion yes. and our desire to be in love. And, and often, you know, we'll hear people say, it's, it's been said for many years now, you know, the Bible is the greatest love letter of all time and it's God's love letter to us. And I believe that's true. And the Song of Songs sits right at the center of it, almost even like the paginational center, like it's really kind of in the middle of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But I think it offers a way of reading the whole Bible and understanding that this is the way that God loves us, his church, his people. And it's it's really passionate. It, uh -huh. It's full. It's very beautiful. It's rich. It's alive. It's well, not the, bri born. the bridal spousal relationship, bride and uh, the bride and the groom, this, this is one of the greatest themes in all of Scripture, of God being the bridegroom and we're the, we're the bride. And so this sits right in the heart of it. But you know, in talking to men specifically, and I, I would I would consider this show 
to be a success if men start reading this book yeah. more and Amen. more, is that it, deep down inside, we really want to love unconditionally. We really want to yeah. give ourselves. We are givers. We are lovers. And at the same time, we really want to be loved. I mean, all out loved unconditionally. Deep down inside, all of that is greater than rubies and diamonds. Everything else is to, is to actually experience that. But l l let me read just a couple lines here as we, before we get into yeah. it, because these are not lines that I th would think would woo a woman. If I was single and I came up to her and said, your neck is like the Tower of David built for an arsenal. I don't know if they'd respond very well <laughs> yeah. uh, to that, and I know that there's many. Oh, yeah. There's many other ones. What's what's one of your favorite? Well, the, the, yeah, that whole litany. There's a couple sections where the bridegroom is describing the bride, and he's talking about her nose and her eyes, her neck, her. her you got to be careful head. and sensitive when you talk about a girl's eyes and nose. Yeah, we had, there was a religious sister I know who drew. She did a sketch of what it would look like if this was actually a woman, and she drew like the neck and the the tower and the bucklers. Pretty attractive. The yeah, it was a pretty messy picture. <laughs> it was well done, but it was not the sort of thing. This is not the way you really woo a woman. Yeah, right. Which, but that kind of gives us permission to realize that this isn't isn't really to be read literally, because yeah. this is not this is not the language of flattery. Although there are elements of it that we have to kind of get back into the setting to understand that that some of it is a little bit more flat, like a belly, a uh, heaping belly. Yeah, it's a sign of abundance, you know. We like to be thin and, and fit, but but if you had enough money to eat a lot of food, you had a little I'm still not going to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not giving this, is not marriage advice. In reading the Song of Solomon, uh, one thing that is, it seems almost totally necessary is to understand the context, to understand the country, to understand the, the geography, to understand the way of life, to understand uh, an agricultural life and so forth. Uh, someone in Manhattan who has never left Manhattan might not exactly know what we're talking about here. So there is some study that we need to do to immerse ourselves. Quite a bit. Super simple example is this. There's a couple references to the apple tree. Uh, she describes, the, the bride describes her beloved as an apple tree. And I, that didn't used to resonate with me. I, I don't really personally like apples. Oh, it touches me deeply. Yeah, well, you're an apple guy. Yeah. <laughs> I had braces for years, so I couldn't eat apples. I just did, I didn't like apples. So I was, I was like, oh, that, that line doesn't really attract me. I was reading a commentary, though, in which the, the, the commentator explained that apple trees were foreign to the setting in which this was probably composed. So while we think of apples as very common fruit that you can find in any lunchbox, any mm -hmm. table, it was a really rare thing. And so if you smelled and tasted and saw apples, you knew you were dealing with foreign imported luxury. And so it's a sign of this, this yeah. magnificence, not a sign of ordinariness. Yeah. So there's, there's two in the relationship. There is the bride and there's the bridegroom. There's, there's a God and his beloved. How would you describe God uh, in the Song of Solomon, if I were to come up to you and I said, well, Father, I just read this book and I can't quite figure it out. Is this talking about God and what is God like? So the, the, for me, the, the easiest way to, to answer that is to, to zoom out a little bit and look at the flow of Scripture before this or what's been happening. We, mm -hmm. After the fall, we went out into the wilderness and the Lord was leading us, promising the promised land, leading us toward a, another kind of garden and a place of flourishing and order and harmony and delight. As, as the covenant was established, and you guys have covered this in other shows, I'm sure plenty, but as, as Israel couldn't keep their side of the bargain and kept breaking this covenant and thus uh, breaking the heart of God, he continued to pursue them through the prophets in language that was, was typically spousal, very often the language of, of searching out a bride who's been unfaithful, trying to win her back or call her back. Sure. <clears throat> so when you read through the prophets, especially Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, um, they all, uh, I'm missing one, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah, Hosea, they mm -hmm. all reference this, this woman who's been unfaithful and God's yeah. trying to bring her back. So if you, if you sit with this, this reality that God has been searching for a faithful bride or trying to bring this bride back to himself for centuries now, by the time you come to the Song of Songs, it's almost like this summary of that whole pursuit that God has been in love with this bride who has not been perfect and, and isn't perfect in reality, but, but he, mm -hmm. he keeps pursuing her and he keeps searching her out because he sees something in her that she doesn't even really see in herself. Yeah. And, and by the time we get here, then this is the story of that whole history becoming personal. Now it's, it's not just an idea. It's not just this distant God. It's a man speaking to a woman. And that gives us like, oh, this gets a little bit more concrete now. This is a, we're called into a serious relationship here, a, mm -hmm. a covenant that, that is actually really beautiful and really passionate. Well, it's not something we think about when we think about God. You, know, you have a tendency to think of God is on the throne 
and there are the laws and, you know, and so forth. And now here suddenly we have, not suddenly, but here we have now uh, a picture of God passionately pursuing a bride. And that's not how you typically think of it. Yeah. No, know? it's... Here's God. He wants this relationship. Yeah, and it would even be disarming and perhaps like off-putting to some notions of God that he would want to get this personal, that he is a personal God. Yeah. For Israel, I, we, we can only speculate, right? But there was a certain distance and a certain um, desire to be familiar with God, but also this fear of God that was ordered, but sometimes maybe excessive. And as we move through the story and it starts to get more personal, the Song of Songs personalizing all of it, I also think it's like a preparation for what's to come which is that this is going to become so personal that God himself is going to take up flesh and we're ready to really understand what it means to, to be in a, a relationship that's, that's one of love, that's a covenant that's everlasting. So while, <clears throat> while the song is like summarizing this whole pursuit of God, it's also getting us ready to realize like this is about to get very personal. Mm -hmm. So personal that, that the, the bridegroom is going to have a face and a name. He's going to speak to us. We're going to hear his words. And we're going to know with much greater clarity than any generation before what it means to follow and what it means to be in love with this God who's come to bring us home. You know, it's so interesting to think of this uh, pursuit of God uh, with, with the, the, the bride. We're, we're the bride. We're the bride of Christ. So I guess the question uh, begs to be uh, asked, does he ever get her? Uh, that's a, so there's a great little debate. If you read the song, so one maybe method for looking at the Song of Songs is to realize it's pretty short. And it's kind of worth reading it all the way through once or twice. Sure. It might take a half hour, hour. But just to get a sense for like this back and forth movement and, and this real question of like, is, is this consummated? Is it not? Is there this rest that they both search for? And different scholars kind of disagree on if and when that happens. It, it seems like it's suspended and never quite reaches its resolution. I mean, the very last line is, is this request that the, the beloved would make haste and that, that this could find a communion or resolution. So it's a very open-ended, um, uh, it's an invitation, I think, into the interior life in which we don't have direct, clear, concrete conclusions to questions like that. And so we can say, maybe this is unfolding still for each of us. Maybe this is actually a bit of the story of God's pursuit of the individual soul, you or I. And, and each of us is going to encounter the Lord coming after us and trying to bring us to himself uniquely. And, sure. and that answer is going to be, I think, for each of us, we're going to have our own like episodic and periodic response. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too, <clears throat> is that uh, chapter 9 is yet to be written. Exactly. Uh, and that is your response. Uh, the, the question would be, did he get you? Oh, you know? me, <clears throat> Father John, personally. Yeah. Yeah, he got me with this song, actually, Jeff. Like, it's a... <clears throat> I, uh, I've always been kind of romantic. I, I love... Even as a kid, I liked romance movies and stories of love and, and poetry. And I came across this book in seminary, and it, it was definitely hard to read and confusing. And my fifth, my fifth year, my first year of priesthood, fifth year in seminary, I was going on a retreat up at a monastery in Northern, I was studying in Italy, going up to this Benedictine monastery of nuns of perpetual adoration. And the, I didn't have a real plan for what the retreat would be about. <clears throat> and uh, the night before, the day before the Lord said, you're just gonna read the Song of Songs. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a romance book. I've, mm -hmm. I've looked at it. I was like, and that's all you're gonna read. I'm like, that's all I'm gonna read. It's a pretty short book and it's about a bride. And it's like, that's all you're gonna read. I took it to my spiritual director. We're like, yeah, I guess all I'm gonna do is read the Song of Songs. It'll help you in counseling <clears throat> later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I spent five full days in silence <clears throat> reading nothing but the Song of Songs, hmm. which was hard because it's a, the, the subject is a bride, and I'm a guy, and I don't think of myself as a bride, and I don't think of myself in relation to God Which is way. a question I want to ask later. Yeah, let's come back to it because yeah. it's, it's it takes a little bit of uh, seemingly mental gymnastics, but it's also really important for understanding the church. Anyway, through that retreat, I just I realized that God's, God's pursuing me. And as a man, I'm often in pursuit, you know, or as men, we want to give ourselves in love in the pattern of Jesus Christ and for you in marriage. But, but to, to be pursued by God, <clears throat> excuse me, and to receive God's pursuit of me and realize that he's interested in everything and in bringing me back into <clears throat> a loving communion that I, I tend to step out of, that was a new way of praying. Yeah. And um, yeah, I found myself moved and blushing and open and receptive in prayer in ways that weren't necessarily my previous comfort zone, but all of a sudden I realized I, uh, I'm in love with God who's in love with me, and, yeah. and God is the protagonist here, and I'm the recipient, right. I'm the respondent, I'm charged with surrender, and, and he leads a follow. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you were blushing. You also mentioned that you are a romantic. Um, 
And I, I want to ask you this question because there's a lot of guys that are thinking about the priesthood. They're thinking, you're thinking about the priesthood, and you're thinking, well, the priesthood means that that part of my life will no longer be. I will just be a dispenser of sacraments and, and greet people after Mass. You know, that's not true, though, is it? Is that a priest is a passionate, romantic person deep in his heart, but this gives context. Oh, yeah. He has to be. If he's not, you know, this, this faulty idea about the celibate states for men and for women that, that somehow you leave behind that desire to, to give and to be given in love and yeah. to receive and to grow and flourish in a, in a love bond. Mm -hmm. that, that's a faulty and, and immature kind of theology of, of celibacy because we bring into our ordination or consecration our whole story. Sure. And as a man, <clears throat> so kind of back to that story, it took me a long time to be able to pray as the bride. And for about 10 years, that's the way I prayed. But, but now <clears throat> the Lord has taken me into seeing that the bridegroom in the Song of Songs is a, is a prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus. And so I, as a priest, can pray through how the bridegroom relates to the bride and realize this is the way I'm supposed to relate to the church. This is the way I'm supposed to understand how Christ pours out his love, how he gives himself, and how, how much he's interested in like all of the details. I mean, the, the descriptions <clears throat> that we can look at more in detail if you want, they're, they're very vivid, but they're also thorough. There's nothing, there's no detail that the bridegroom misses. He praises everything he can find to praise about her because he's just that thoroughly interested. In Would that every husband spoke <laughs> of his wife that way, your uh, marriage counseling would be reduced by about 80%, I imagine, if that, if, that, if that were the case. Before we get into some of the examples here, what would you say to young men today who are thinking about the priesthood, but they have somehow, some way reduced it to, that just simply means no women? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in the end, the priesthood has to be about falling in love the way that Jesus falls in love. So John Paul II, when he wrote Pastoris Dabo Vobis, he said the church, as the bride, longs to be loved by the priest in the same way that she's loved by Christ, mm -hmm. which is as a bridegroom. So the mm -hmm. church's ache, the, the, the general, the broad ache of the church is to be loved as a bride. And that's God who's loving her as a bride, but he asks some men to be configured to his heart and to, to feel the ache of his heart and to, with him, continue that oblation and to share in his his canonic outpouring while also um, sharing the sentiments of his heart, yeah. being in love with the same bride. And so for a, uh, for a young man, you, you have to be able to love a woman and love her well and be willing to fight for her and defend her and want to uphold her to make a, a good priest and then eventually to, to desire to father in that, in that setting, the supernatural setting. So not that the Song of Songs is something that is going to be the deciding point for your discernment, but as a priest, it's been a place of my realizing I can find my way into the heart of Christ through Scripture in a very rich way, the Song of Songs with John's Gospel mm -hmm. in particular, in a way that helps me realize that this is actually still all about being a bridegroom. No doubt you have a, a number of points in this Song of Solomon, Song of Songs that have really stood out to you to be so important in our lives. Yeah. One place that, that is important to see in the Song of Songs and to really maybe to pray with how we are the bride is that the bride, she doesn't think of herself as beautiful. At least I don't think so. There's a way of reading it that you could argue otherwise. But in the first chapter, she describes herself as, as dark or sunburned and, and not lovely. She says, don't stare at me because I'm swarthy and, and burned by the sun. The sun has scorched me. And I was reading a couple commentaries on this years ago, and it opened up a, a really rich way of counseling people in their own prayer, but also realizing the beauty of the soul and the church before God. And what the commentator was describing at the time, this is so different for us, our mindset, but at the time of composition in Palestine, in that area, to be sunburned or tan meant that you, you had to work in the fields and she's keeping the vineyard. You had to go outside. The, the wealthy stayed inside mm -hmm. underneath a, a canopy. And so they didn't take color from the sun. And so pale skin was a sign of wealth. Tan skin is a sign of poverty. It's like the reverse now. You know, we pay to get tan and yeah, we do. for fair skin, we're embarrassed. But then it was fair skin is a sign of wealth and, and dark skin is a sign of poverty. So right away, she's they're looking at her and, and she says, don't stare at me because I'm, I'm sunburned. I'm, 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 I'm lowly, I'm poor. And this, who, this bridegroom who reveals himself to be a king is the one who's looking at her and she's uncomfortable with that because she's noting like, we're of a different class. I don't deserve, I'm not on your level. I... I don't have a right to this relationship. And, and she expresses that at the beginning of the song, and the bridegroom doesn't really engage it. He, he just begins to praise her beauty, 
which is his own answer, but it's also this, he doesn't need to engage her protests. Yeah. Her protests actually kind of attract him. It's into that that he starts to speak. So he's about her so he in in a way he's not he's not arguing with her about it. He's simply telling her the truth. Yeah. And the truth is not what you've been thinking exactly. about yourself. But yeah. my dear, let me tell you the truth. Totally. Here's how you see yourself and know yourself. Let me tell you what I see. Mm-hmm. And and that that has to be in the interior life what we're always willing to to hear from God because yeah. we're always ashamed of our darkness, of our sin, of the things we've done, of our poverty. That's, that's all shameful stuff. It's embarrassing. We don't want anybody to know about it. We confess it, but we also carry this, yeah, if anybody knew that about right. me, they'd look away. Mm. I think that's what the bride is saying. Yeah. And, and the bridegroom acknowledges, receives, and then just starts to praise her beauty. His first line to her, you are beautiful, my love. You're beautiful. Yeah, and then it goes on. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. It's like she's going not only into the fact that she's 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 dark, but uh, everything else in her life doesn't seem to be matching up to yeah. what she thinks he would want. Yeah, she doesn't. It, it, in her mind, it doesn't make sense. And that's, so there's this set of different ways of reading the song, the song of Songs. One is to see this as the love of God in Israel. The other to see it as the love of God for the church once the new covenant comes. And then, especially St. Bernard was the one who said, we really should read it as, as addressed to the individual soul and, and first and foremost to Mary. Mm-hmm. So there's this way of seeing um, God looking at the church that way, God looking at Israel that way, God looking at me that way. But in, in any one of those modes, in me, in you, in the church, there's always going to be something odious or broken and, and rather repulsive. But, but in, the, in the bridegroom's eyes, that's, that's what he comes for. Um, Columba Marmion, when he wrote a treatise on consecrated virginity, he says, our, our weakness and our misery, far from repulsing him, it's this that, that he's come to cure. It actually attracts him. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of what we see happening here in, in, the, in the Song of Songs. Is he's attracted to her own uh, embarrassment, but also her thought that she's not worthy. He's like, no, it's my gaze that makes you worthy. It's what I see in you and that I draw forth that beautiful. makes you radiant. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. So uh, what would be the next major thing for you? Well, there's, yeah, so there's a couple of things in, in chapter two that are really moving to me. The first, maybe to double back on that point, mm-hmm. and I, this has been a recent place of prayer for me. So at the beginning of chapter two, verse one, the, the bride says, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. So she's identifying herself as these two pretty famous flowers in the, in the compositional context. And that in itself is beautiful. So we'll often see roses and lilies surrounding Mary and in, in Christian art based on the Song of Songs. But it's, it's the bridegroom's response that I actually have been and stuck on lately, which is chapter 2, verse 2. She says, I'm a lily of the valleys, which is a flower among flowers. So there are many flowers in these valleys. The bridegroom gently, I think, corrects her. He says, as a lily among brambles, so is my love among maidens. Meaning that, that she, in her, eye, in her own eyes, she's a flower among many. In his eyes, she stands out as one. And, and the brambles, if we can draw back on Genesis 3, after the fall, you know, the ground is cursed and it's going to bear thorns, yeah. brambles, as a fruit of man's labor, the sweat of his brow. He sees the world of sin all around her. Right. And she stands out in the middle of it as this one lily. So for, for me, that's become the place of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in her, like why Mary and likeness is so important and, and why the church has to be like Mary. That, I think that's how he's looking at it. It's like, I see the sin all around you. I see yeah. the fallen world, but you you stand out. You're not just a flower among flowers. You're this What a great flower. word. What a great word from God for people who are saying to themselves constantly, uh, there's so many other people. Why would I be special? Why would I be chosen? And uh, uh, you know, with everything on the internet and all the search for being liked on the internet, why in the world would he want me or why would anybody want me? And he's giving an answer. That's it. To you that. stand out. And yeah. it's in a way, just like in the, in the natural world, flowers don't repeat themselves. The soul is much more complex and elegant. And, and mm-hmm. so we can apply all these things to the soul. It's right from there, though, to your, your other question and related, I think. Just after that, in verse 6, there's this other line that I didn't used to understand and recently I've been praying with. It's when he says, or the bride says this, Oh, that his left hand were under my head, and his right hand embraced me. So I didn't, I didn't used to think about that much until I, a buddy of mine, we were preaching a retreat, and he just demonstrated what's, what's going on there. Like that his mm-hmm. left hand were under my head, so she's laying on his left hand, and his right arm embraces me. So his right arm is around her waist. Another mm-hmm. translation says about my waist. So she's... She's laying down in his arms. 
And, and you can remember a number of these places where God promises to give Israel rest because they were restless. Or, mm. or Psalm 23, he makes me lie down in verdant pastures. Hosea, the prophets, the promise to, to, to make her lie down so that he can espouse her in faithfulness, righteousness, and truth. There's this desire of Israel to, to rest. Yeah. There's this restlessness that we all know in the midst of our sin. She's saying, my desire is to rest and to lie down. And, and, and the context of the song is saying, when we do that, when we do that with him, he's actually holding us. Yeah. He's holding us up. And that's, that's the posture, like reclining before the Lord in which we can hear that word. Now that you're done running around, now that you're done restless, now that you're done carrying all your burdens as the nomadic Israelites, now that you can you know, relax and, and set up tent or uh, pitch tent, I can speak to you about who you are and you're not going anywhere. To imagine Jesus holding you like that, saying, it's all right. That's it. Yeah. And thinking even about that, that desire for rest and his promise of rest, and then Israel's story, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but thinking about the nomadic years of Israel when, in flight from enemies especially, you have to have all your possessions bundled up. I actually looked up recently um, how to gird your loins, because, you know, Israel eats with loins girt, and there's a couple other passages, because I wear a cassock a lot. They show you how to, like, wrap it, tie it, and you're basically tying everything up so your legs are free to run. Yeah. And, and that's a living in flight. That's a, a panicked way of like, I don't know if I'm safe. Yeah. And I've got to have my possessions ready to go. And we're going to be on the move because we're in flight from an enemy. Physically, even in that posture, there's not room for relaxing and reclining and even even natural intimacy. Yeah. Like when the loins are girt, you can't be intimate with your with your beloved. Mm -hmm. So the, the loins girt, the heart girt is a, a posture of fear and flight that Israel has in the scriptures, but I also think the human we tend to have in all of our lives. We, we bind up our hearts and we kind of live in flight. Jesus says, come, come and rest. Let me, let me hold you in, in, in my, your, my arms yeah. and you can let down your guards so that I can be intimate with you, so that divine intimacy can unfold. If we're in flight always, we're not really gonna be able to be intimate yeah. supernaturally, just like our bodies show us naturally we can't be intimate. Yeah, that's beautiful, that, that's beautiful. So that's called a springtime, a springtime canticle. Uh, chapter two. Now, before we move on to any other chapters, do you find a connection between the chapters or are they kind of like, you know, James in the New Testament is, the rabbis would call it uh, a stringing pearls. In other words, it's just a truth, a truth, a truth, a truth, a truth. Not necessarily related, but just going to give you all these truths. Do we have just a bunch of truths here or is are these being tied together somehow? The, the, the thing that would tie them together is the, is the dialogue or the dance of love. Okay, the dance would be, yeah. okay. But there is a back and forth and, and there's argument, I think a decent argument that some of these poems would fit together real easily and a couple others might have been inserted you know, later on to, mm -hmm. to create a flow, but maybe the, they don't see the flow as being uh, as evident as a narrative would show it. But you'll see at the beginning, this, this dialogue begins, then there's moving into talking about beauty, then she loses the bridegroom, he, he goes away and she's searching for him and she's in angst. John of the Cross spends a lot of time in that place in his writings. And then there's this return and the dialogue kind of reaches an even more intense degree. They're praising each other uh, more thoroughly, more beautifully. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there's a kind of a, what might be a consummation, but this place where, where she names him as altogether desirable. His speech is most sweet and this is my beloved and this is my friend. So there is an, a narrative arc, I think, but, but you're free to kind of hop in. So I read the Song of Songs every day and I don't read it straight through. I just pop in wherever, wherever I flip open and I sure. just let that be the beginning of prayer because it's just the, the dialogue of love and the Lord is outside of time so he can hop in wherever we want or wherever he wants and just kind of meet us there. Yeah. And there are times in the Song of, Song of Solomon where you, you are, you're aware of the fact that it's the bride grooming the bride in the dance going on. But in the description of the bridegroom and the bride, there are things that are said that are just really amazing theological truths, both universally, but also within the, in the relationship of the beloved, of a bride and the groom. And one of them that has always come to me is uh, Song of Solomon, chapter two and verse 15. Uh, Catch the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. And I take something like that, and I could say to somebody in life in general, look it, it's the little foxes that, that uh, the spoil the vineyards. It's not the great big problems out there, it's these little things that can spoil it. But in the context of the bridegroom and the bride, in marriage, the little foxes can spoil oh, yeah. things. You've thought of that? Oh, yeah. And, and with that, in particular, as that unfolds in the Song of Songs, it's mm -hmm. not her or him being vigilant. It's them. 
Just before that, he says, my dove in the cleft of the rocks, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. But right before that, arise, my love, my dove, my fair one, and come away. So they go away together uh-huh. out to the vineyards to catch these foxes, the little foxes, so that the vineyards aren't spoiled because our vineyards are in blossom. So it's vigilance, of course, is vital, and, and Christ exhorts us to that all the time. But a little invitation here is to see that he, he's with us to catch the foxes. And catching foxes is... It's not like you're you're slaying dragons. They're they're little, like you said, and it almost has the tone of uh, it's kind of fun. It's like if we, if we go out and do this together, let's get those little foxes. And they're going to destroy them if we leave them. But like it's also kind of a game. It's a hunt, and they and they go out together. So it's like yeah. let's go get the foxes. Yeah, it, you you almost want to challenge uh, married couples to sit down and and. Uh, contemplate, what are the little foxes in, yeah. your, in your relationship? Let's go catch them. Yeah, let's go Preserve catch them. The let's do it together. Yeah. Like you said, I love yeah. that. Let's do it together. You got problems in your marriage? Let's let's solve this together. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. This is kind of a secret uh, um, book for men, I think. You know, I've noticed that at conferences, for example, you talk about some of these things in relationships, and you you talk to the men and say, well, man, this is what you need to do with your with your bride. The, their bride is next to them going like this, <laughs> you know, like, do it, like, perform. But in this book, it, you, a man can get an idea, not not the first reading necessarily, but if they pursue God in, in the Song of Solomon, you can get some of these ideas on how to love the bride and, and how to pursue the bride. And uh, she doesn't have to be next to you in a class. That's it. That's, <laughs> That's it. That's good. Yeah. And I think, you know, we talked also about this earlier, but uh, one of the keys in, in the whole spiritual life, really, but what helps us in the song or why the song is an important part of the scripture for the spiritual life, we, we've got to come to a place of realizing that God is the lover of our soul mm-hmm. and he's the prime lover. No, like no matter what our vocation is, the first lover of our soul is God. And we're called into a love of God that lasts past death. And all the rest of our relationships will be related in heaven. But marriage, sacramental marriage here, is, is to get us to heaven and passes away with death, the, the sacramental bond itself. So <clears throat> each of us, men, women, whatever our state in life, to pray with the Song of Songs is a way of realizing, like, I have to first be in this posture of being loved by God and, and given in that love. And out of that, then, I can understand how I'm supposed to relate to whoever God puts in front of me in my vocation, be that a spouse, be that a parish, be that a, a people that I serve in, in some sort of sure. ministry. Yeah. But that's the prime place of, of, of abiding before the Lord. And this is a difficult book for that, but also like a central book for realizing I have to let the love get personal if my vocation is going to be fulfilling. Yeah. When we find that somebody loves us, mm. And let's say you're 20 years old and someone loves you. You have been standing in front of the mirror for 20 years. You know every defect in you, on you, in you, around you. And you have struggled with, will anybody ultimately love me? What would you tell them from this book Mm -hmm. that God is obviously pursuing you, but you're looking in the mirror in the bathroom saying, this can't be. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the, the dilemma you're naming is just our, our tendency to get stuck staring at our faults or, or navel-gazing or looking into the broken places. Um, one, one way around that that I find is, is actually from the Song of Songs when the, bride, the bridegroom describes the bride as an enclosed garden mm-hmm. and a fountain sealed. The mystical tradition then carries that forth to say that the sanctuary of the soul is where God lives. And, and that's a microcosm of Eden, of paradise yeah. in us, God living with us. So when, when we're getting stuck on our faults or we're looking in the mirror and seeing all these things we hate about ourselves, sometimes what's actually happening is we're just not going deep enough. We're not going to the center of the soul and realizing like, no, I understand, God might say, I understand why those things make you feel repulsive, why you feel dark, ugly, unattractive, too broken because of what you did or what was done to you. I understand all those things. But those aren't the central part. Those mm-hmm. are actually like outer layers of the heart and, and experiences in our personality. But underneath all that, I claimed you for myself. And my claim cannot be undone. Mm-hmm. And that sanctuary of the soul, that inner garden, seems to me in, in a spiritual direction I'm finding for a lot of people just a place we haven't gone. Yeah. It's like, um, did you ever remember The Secret Garden? That story, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a, a kid's book. It was actually kind of a girl's kid's book. Right. I had sisters. And so I have daughters, all daughters. Yeah. But it's really, it's a great story of this garden that was closed off because of pain. So the, the man built this beautiful garden for his wife. She died in that garden. So he closed it off because he couldn't handle the memory. And nobody forgot about it on this big property until eventually these kids find their way and they find the key. They come into the garden 
And they restore the garden, and all of a sudden, it's this place of healing. Like, the boy is healed, the girl is healed, the father comes back in there, and he's healed. And it's like the healing power of this, this inner sanctuary. And I, I believe often, and now I don't know how much theology the author of The Secret Garden was trying to work mm-hmm. out, but I, I think at the center of the soul, there is this secret place that's not secret to God because he chose it as the sanctuary. But, but often, we don't go deeply enough to sit down, to recline there, and not be in self-defense and self-provision mode. But, but that's underneath the stuff that we resist. And, yeah. and moving too quickly out of that, we, we get stuck in the wilderness around the outside of the garden instead of getting to the enclosed garden. Yeah. But that takes a prayer life, you know? Like yeah, yeah. No, I, I, know, I know what you're saying there. When, um, when someone reads the Song of Solomon and they come across uh, certain phrases that cause us to blush, to cause us to... If someone were to say... Um, uh, what are you reading? Well, we do this. We go, uh, John. I, w- I wasn't reading back here. Trust me, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was over here in the Gospels and I was reading. But some of it is so beautiful. But it belongs in the context of a bridal spousal relationship, and it almost it almost demands that there be a level of maturity yeah. in looking at it, not as a thirteen year old boy, yeah. but as a man. Yep. And, and that's a key, we could say a lot about this. I think um, there, there are groups of people and parts of the, parts of the world, I've, I've wa- walked with different religious sisters who grew up in parts of the world where they were not allowed to read this book hmm. in, in school growing up because it, mm-hmm. it, it seems to be very sexual in its language. Sometimes there are references to, very direct references to things that could, could become a temptation, I suppose, if you yeah. do approach it like a 13-year-old. But, but if we accept that it's inspired, then this is, this is God speaking and God can't speak a sin, can't speak wickedness, can't cause us into wickedness. We have to choose that. So really there's a way of seeing like God would never say anything to us that's impure. Right. So if I come into this and I hear like, that sounds impure, well, that's in me and that's, right. that's fine. That's a place where we got to do a little work, mm-hmm. but that's not how God's speaking to me. And so that's actually not how the song is speaking either. So what do you do at that point? If you read um, uh, chapter seven, verse three, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. And it, and it goes on and you get into some of the, 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 um, the language about uh, the beloved's body uh, and you have that moment where it's like, uh, you're, you might feel uncomfortable. What would you recommend someone do at that point? So there's a, the quickest thing that I found or the most effective thing actually is to rely on Bernard and the tradition in which we see this song as spoken to Mary. And so what I'll do often in direction or myself, I'll read through the song and I'll say, let's have the Blessed Virgin Mary be the bride first. Okay. And let's watch the Lord say all these things to her. And let's see how he says them, what's it like, knowing that he would, he sees her as the, the, the perfect bride, she's sinless, he would, of course, never say anything sinful to her. But sometimes that gets us out of ourselves, be like, okay, if he's gonna praise things like her breasts, it's because they're praiseworthy. Mm-hmm. Not because it's an object of lust. And other people said that too, you know, in the <laughs> exactly. Gospels. Exactly, it's, it's in the Gospels. Yeah. So we can, we can make a meditation and watch, and, and we can ask Our Lady to help us here. Like, Mary, show me what it's like for you to receive these words. Because mm. I, I know she knew this book. I know she prayed it. I actually believe that Jesus spoke some of these words to her. That's kind of, maybe that'd be a little contentious of a claim, but if Jesus is the word incarnate, He's the Trinity, right? Who's been waiting and searching mm-hmm. out this bride through all of Israel's history. He finally finds her in Mary. And so he takes up flesh in, in, in his body. He's experiencing the divine delight in finally seeing this bride who he's waited for from the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. So there's a way I think he spoke to Mary. Jesus spoke to Mary. Some of the words of the song. And we can say, teach me about that. Mary, Jesus, teach me about that. So I don't have to be afraid. Yeah. And then I can, I'll sit with Mary sometimes or have a religious, if I'm directing a religious, I'll have them sit with Mary and say, now ask Mary to help you hear the words with her right at your side. So you know you're safe. You know there's no unchastity here. This is God speaking yeah. to you, not your fallenness. And Mary will often really walk us into seeing like, okay, that was in me, not in God, that was the fear. Yeah. You mentioned earlier uh, uh, Amos and Hosea. You mentioned Isaiah. Uh, you, we talk about we talked a little bit about the uh, the summation of the prophets and and talking about the bride and the and the bridegroom, but there's also that preparation for Christ. How do you see this book as as preparing us for for Jesus? Man, thank you, T ball. I love Is that. that. T-ball yeah, question? I love that question. It's, <laughs> it's one of the most important questions. That's the reason that I find the song so important because it gets us ready to understand the gospels. In that, we're moving, so in the Old Covenant, right, everything is spoken 
over Israel generally. There's one temple. Everybody has to go up to Israel. And so the people is the subject, even if they're personified as a, a singularity, it's still mm-hmm. a, a generality. In the New Covenant, we know that it becomes personal. It becomes now what, what was said to Israel is now said to each of us. It's spoken deeply and intimately and personally. Each of us is a sanctuary. The temple's here. We're all a temple and the temple's here. So the Song of Songs takes that general reality and starts to make it personal and personifies the bridegroom. So already in our mind, we're thinking, okay, this is this, these are words spoken, not from a distant God, but from a bridegroom who, who I can actually start to imagine. So that when we get to the, the, the Gospel of John, where Jesus is identified immediately as a bridegroom, the alarm bell should be going off like, oh, I've been, I've been praying about this. I've been prepared by God for this by the Song of Songs, which told me all about how this bridegroom is going to love this bride mm-hmm. and, and how it's going to be related to the temple. Like John, the gospel opens up with a reference to the creation account. The beginning of the prologue is so rich. There's sacrificial language immediately, the Lamb of God. And what does the Lamb do right away? goes to a wedding, John 2, like the lamb goes to the wedding. And so boom, like we should be thinking about the book of Revelation, the wedding feast of the lamb. What does he do after the wedding? He goes to the temple, he cleanses it. What does he say then when he's asked? I'm gonna destroy this temple and rebuild it. There's gonna be a new temple. I mean, it's all it's all one movement of God toward, toward the eschaton. Mm-hmm. But the Song of Songs really gets us ready if we pray through the whole of scripture to be like, okay, I'm already prepared to see how Jesus is gonna love this bride, is gonna love me. And, and what I'm seeing in John 1, John 2, John 3, uh, when, when John the Baptist identifies him, especially as the bridegroom, John 4, the woman at the well, where, where it, it starts to get very tangible. Like we're talking about a, a relationship of love and a marriage here. We, and, he, and he wasn't supposed to be there. Exactly. <laughs> Midday, woman who's not faithful. Moses, Isis, Isaac, Jacob, all their wives are found at wells. I mean, this is a place of wedding. And he's, he's already identified as a bridegroom, and now he's searching out this lost Samaritan woman. Yeah. But this, if you have the Song of Songs in the backdrop, you know that God has been pursuing this for a long time. And it's going to be this relentless pursuit through the protests of shame and a willingness to draw. What does he say later? I will draw all to myself. Yeah. The bride is the one who first said that in the Song of Songs, draw me. You've read this book before. You're doing, <laughs> you're, it's good. It's good <laughs> stuff. You know, and I, know, I know that you're a blessing to, to everyone who's watching. I'll tell you what, isn't this good? Such good stuff. We're going to take a break when we come back. We're going to, going to get to know Father a little bit more and his study habits in the Bible. And then we also have a few questions of yours. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jeff Cavins, and I'm excited to introduce you to the Ascension app. It contains the full text of the Great Adventure Bible, the full text of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and both the Bible and Catechism in a Year podcasts. The app has special features that make the connections between the Bible and the Catechism crystal clear, like color-coded crosslinks and easy navigation. It also answers nearly 1,000 questions from Bible in a Year listeners about the Bible with videos from myself and others, also audio clips and excerpts from Ascension's popular books. To download the app, simply go to the App Store on your phone and search Ascension. I hope you enjoy it. I enjoy it. Carry it around everywhere I go. Welcome back to the Bible Timeline Show. I'm Jeff Gavins. My guest is Father John Burns from Milwaukee. And wow, have we had a great conversation. I was just saying during the break that uh, you're a good teacher and now you make me want to go deeper into the Song of Solomon. No, it's an honor. And, uh, I think I'm going to read it before I go home and see my wife. <laughs> there you go. This is, uh, this is really, really good. <laughs> Can't pick up some new lines. You know, with every one of our guests, we, we, we talk about a period of salvation history, of the great adventure in the Bible timeline. But we also want to know about you mm-hmm. personally. You've been studying the Word. You went to Rome. And uh, I know that the Word of God is, is central in your life. How do you interact with Scripture on a regular basis? No cameras, you're not at Mass. Where's the Bible in your life? Yeah, I travel with it. I mean, I bring it with me everywhere I go, so as to always have Scripture uh, nearby. And then I read during my Holy Hour, I always read some Scripture. So I pray Holy Hour every day, and I, read, I bring the Bible, I read Scripture. Um, I would say, though, it's really grown. And uh, something that grew for me, or what really helped me, was... I, as a priest, you're always in the scriptures because you're preaching homilies and always prepping. And so that's mm-hmm. an, an unavoidable part of the a gift and an unavoidable part. You're just in it. But um, I noticed a handful of years ago that I moved with scripture, but I wasn't like on fire with it. And and I started to just notice, like, I want to love scripture more. I had a couple of buddies who were like always opening the Bible and always in the scriptures. And it was actually when I, when I noticed the looking at the Bible, that the book of Revelation, even though this is an old book, 
the book of Revelation was written a long time ago, but hasn't happened yet in time. So I started thinking like, man, we, so we live inside the Bible. Like this is a, this isn't complete yet. It's not a, just a dated text. It's all of this hasn't come to pass. So I started to ask the Lord, like, give me a, a fire for scripture. Like make me love the scripture more than I do. And I just prayed that for maybe like a year. And I, I can't even tell you when exactly it happened, Jeff, but I just kind of woke up one day. I'm like, I can't wait to read the Bible today. And ever since then, it's been years now. Wow. I just love, I love the scripture. And I'm seeing, you know, sometimes in, in theology class, we talk about trying to have the biblical worldview. Like what was the view of the audience at the time? But I've been praying for like a worldview that's biblical. Yeah. Like, how can I see the world through the lens of Scripture? Because it's not done yet. Like, we're in the middle of that story. And and that's just animated running to Scripture now instead of, like, doing the obligatory. I should read it or I should prepare the homily. Like, Lord, you're in this Word. It's alive. Um, help me engage it and, and teach me to love it more. So that was a big key. It was just begging for the love of Scripture. Do you have any favorite verses in the Bible that have fed you or it would be that one that that you would stand with and say, this represents who I am. Mm. You know, because we're in the Song of Songs, I actually draw me, that prayer of the bride, draw me after you. I use that all the time in prayer. I see that as the outcry of the soul, inviting God to draw us into communion and draw us after him. Uh -huh. So I, I use that all the time. That's my, I think it's the most powerful two words in scripture. The name of Jesus is the most powerful name and word. But draw me is, is like the most loaded up prayer we have. It's right at the beginning of the Song of Songs. It's the yeah. outcry of the bride. Oh, so I yeah, pray with Verse that. four. Yeah. Draw me after you, let us make haste. And mm -hmm. then the king has brought me to the chamber. So that's all like the whole spiritual life is kind of contained in those verses. So draw me is my favorite. But I love the beginning of John's gospel that we looked at, identification of Christ as the bridegroom is, is key. Um, and then I love the, the priestly prayer, um, John 14, 15, 16, 17, those chapters where mm -hmm. he's telling us about where he's going and the Father's house and just such consolation to to get the mystery of heaven a little bit more concrete. And be like, I don't have to figure all that out, but but I have Jesus who's the way, the truth, and the life that, that I want to come back to all the time. You mentioned several saints when we were discussing this topic earlier. Are there particular saints in your life that uh, you draw from in the area of the bridal spousal relationship and specifically the Song of Solomon? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, because that's that was the other piece of that retreat where I paired the Song of Songs was a key, but also um, John of the Cross mm. who... He's a poet and a mystic, and he, he, two of his main poems, the Romances, which is this beautiful creation dialogue between the Father and the Son, and then the spiritual canticle. He wrote them while he was in prison. His, his brothers put him in prison because he was reforming the order. And he just, <laughs> he wrote them, they're like rehashings of the Song of Songs. And I realized he had memorized the Song of Songs, didn't have it with him, but he, he wrote poetry based on the Song of Songs. And that became the, the, the basis of the rest of his writings, his commentaries, his teachings. So I realized this man, this master of the mystical life, this father of the Carmelites, he, he, you can't understand it without the Song of Songs. So I started reading him and seeing the Song of Songs throughout all of his writings mm. and understanding <laughs> he, he helps you pray in the posture of the bride, but also to see God as the protagonist and the bridegroom. So that was really the, the saint who brought me into the Song of Songs and, and made me realize I need to take this for myself, not just through, through the words of another. That's great. We have a few questions from our our viewing audience, Carla, reading through the books of the Royal Kingdom hurt my heart a little bit. It made me sad to see all of the broken relationships and harm done to others. In the New Testament, Jesus places a lot of emphasis on forgiveness. Was mm. there much emphasis on forgiveness in the Old Testament? Was it something God called his people to do? Thank you. Mm, that's a fantastic question. Um, and you have, so a couple of, I'll maybe make two contradictory points. One, the, the kind of the original paradigmatic forgiveness and reconciliation stories in Genesis. It's Joseph with his brothers, which is a great, it's a very long section of the first book of the Bible where we see forgiveness, especially reconciliation played out. Mm -hmm. So it's there from the beginning as, a, as, a, as an early model of how good it is, how heroic it is to be forgiving. For, for a lot of the Old Testament, though, the, the vendetta or the eye for eye is in place such that the, the law would say you mm -hmm. can punish equally to what you suffered. If someone has taken your eye, you can take an eye. You can slap for a slap. So there was a, a pretty basic sense of justice and vendetta, vengeance, ordered vengeance um, under the Old Covenant. So forgiveness, interpersonal forgiveness, didn't quite fit into that mindset, which mm -hmm. is, is what she's pointing out or noticing that when Jesus comes, when he teaches interpersonal forgiveness, he's saying... You have heard that it is said, but I say to you, and he's, he's pointing out the old way, the old law, mm -hmm. and he's giving us a new law. So we could say 
the teaching, the, the law itself didn't foresee interpersonal forgiveness the way that the new law does, the new covenant. Uh, and in that, there's also a new grace. There wasn't grace given to live what Christ would later command because he hadn't commanded it yet. Yeah. And so the vendetta was in place or the eye for an eye made sense. But yeah. when Jesus comes, we're in a new paradigm. And so there's a new gift from God to make it possible. Yeah. Would that, we didn't see the divisions now that we do, you know, that we could see that grace lived out. But we do know that we have a grace that wasn't there before for, for the Israelites to, to live interpersonal forgiveness. What does it mean that Solomon received the gift of wisdom? Did it make him smarter? Now, there's a good question, mm. and I guess you gotta, you got you to gotta think about what's wisdom and what's smarter mean. I, I don't know of a Hebrew word for smarter. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> but I can tell you this, that uh, wisdom, you, first of all, you have knowledge. The world is filled with knowledge, completely filled with knowledge. But how you apply that knowledge in your life uh, is either wise or unwise. If you are applying the knowledge and re re interreacting with this knowledge in a way that would be pleasing to God, this is wisdom. You are, you're exercising wisdom. Now, the result of that is understanding. You know, you don't understand something until you, you apply wisdom to the knowledge that you have. And I've unfortunately uh, learned the hard way on a lot, of those, <laughs> a lot of those situations. How about you? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good way of summing it up. And I like to think about wisdom now as a, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit sure. and how much even the wisdom Solomon had, th there's a natural wisdom and then he prays for wisdom, he receives wisdom and he gives to the, to the Jews like these great books. There's a, there's a possibility for wisdom now through the Holy Spirit that is wasn't even given yet in the Old Covenant, mm -hmm. the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I find looking at what, what Solomon did as a wise, as a, as a king who could judge according to the mind of God, not just knowing, but also judging well, mm -hmm. as you're saying, we're, we're meant to have access to that now. And as the Holy Spirit is given to us in baptism and expanded in confirmation, the wisdom of Solomon, we're not going to be smarter maybe or, or wiser than Solomon, but we actually could be as wise as God wants us to be because he's giving us the gift of wisdom, which is yeah. to, to be able to judge things rightly according to the way that God sees them, not the way that you and I see them. So yeah. I love contemplating the wisdom of Solomon and then, and then begging for... Father, this has been phenomenal. Oh, it's such an honor, such a joy. It's just been phenomenal. And uh, uh, I would ask you to, if you could close us out in prayer in light of everything we've talked about. There's mm. so many people who have needs and questions and uh, are living in some of the things we were discussing with each other. And it would just be a blessing to hear, you know, a prayer for them and close it yeah, up. Yeah, for sure. Way. Yeah, we'll use a little scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we, we acknowledge that your gaze is upon us, that you see us. And we pause in this place to, to quit running away and to, to lower our guard, to draw back the veil of our hearts. And just in this moment to acknowledge that there's nowhere we can go that you can't see. There's nothing that we've done that you can't heal. So Lord, I just ask that you would, you'd stir in our hearts the desire to know your love and the desire to receive it. I ask especially, God, that you would stir the Holy Spirit in the hearts of everybody who's watching and praying and listening. And especially, Lord, to stir an awareness that your word is true and that as you look upon us, you see an enclosed garden, a fountain sealed. You see a sanctuary of the soul where you alone dwell and where you wish to come and perfect fruitful love. So please just stir that awareness, God, over and against the tendency to be ashamed of our darkness, our brokenness, our frailty, our sense of being unlovely, not beautiful, not worthy, not good enough, not strong enough. Just gently press the heart through those places, that wilderness, into the deep sanctuary. And grant us, Lord God, the grace to rest there, the grace to receive you there, to hear you say, you are delightful to me. And so, Lord, with all of that in our hearts, we use the words of the Song of Songs and ask you to draw us after you. Let us make haste that you would bring us to the chambers of the kingdom, 
we could meet the Father and with you come to know just how good it is to be sons and daughters filled with his spirit, called to run the pathways of this earth toward the wedding feast of the Lamb. Mary, pray for us, you the bride who received all these words and wished to bring them to us. Teach us by the beauty of your own heart how to know the love of God. We surrender to you, gracious God, and ask all these things in humility. In the name of Jesus, who is Lord and King, Bridegroom and Savior, forever and ever. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. It was really great. Good. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.